Hi there, my name is Victoria Bowler and today we are talking about curriculum sequences for elementary music. This is an update from a pretty old video on curriculum outlines and so I wanted to expand that conversation today. And I'll add the timestamps here so you can jump around if that's what you'd like to do. We'll look at an example of a curriculum outline, we will talk about how it's constructed, and we'll look at a few different examples of other sequences that you might want to use, and then talk about some things that are, importantly, missing from this document related to the curriculum as a whole. So here's the curriculum outline for the 2023-2024 school year inside the Planning Binder. And if you're not already familiar with this document, let's quickly zoom through it and talk about why we might want to have some sort of sequence, maybe somewhat like this, in the first place. So this is a broad look at an entire elementary music program at each level. And you can see that it's organized by musical concepts with different ideas kind of spiraled throughout. And the musical elements here are able to be transferred to many different musical skills and many different areas of musical understanding. That's the emphasis here. Because here's why, if I teach you how to think about pitch, right, and you really understand the concept of melodic contour and pitch relationships and tonal pattern, if I teach you how to think about them and how to hear them and how to articulate what you hear, then you have what you need to transfer that understanding to a different situation. You can figure out a melody by ear on a guitar or harmonica or a barred instrument or whatever it is. You have a musical foundation for what you need in order to do something else, like think of a melody in your head and remember it and then record it or teach it to a friend or write it down or arrange it for an ensemble. It gives you skills that transfer and transform understanding into a new musical setting. That's the goal. Just for clarity's sake, let's look at a non-example of that as well. If we were to teach a unit on how to play songs on barred instruments, students would walk away from that unit, hopefully knowing how to play songs on barred instruments, right? Same thing if we structure our year around songs we're preparing for a performance. At the end of the year, hopefully, students have put on some really exciting performances, but we might not have necessarily given students what they need to link their knowledge and skills to a new musical setting. So then we kind of run into a problem. After our performance, what do we do? After I've taught you these three songs on barred instruments or a recorder or whatever it is, what do we do? What comes next? If we're not spiraling, then we have um, kind of some tricky situations that we get into. So there's a choice here to think about units of musical skills and ideas and concepts that connect. And there's a choice to lean away from individual musical units that are kind of siloed from each other. And definitely that transfer and understanding piece is going to come into play with how we uh, create and implement the units themselves, right? The pedagogy process that we walk through. And certainly we can teach students about um, how to play barred instruments in a way that builds understanding throughout different grade levels. But uh, just thinking kind of big picture here, I think it's helpful to illustrate the choices that we are making with the construction of a document like this. There's some resources that you might be interested in checking out if you are interested in hearing more about this approach or more of my opinion about this approach, I should say. Um, so I'll add two podcast episodes for you to listen to in the description below. Another thing that I think is important to note in a document like this, these are the times that the musical ideas, these musical events are going to be highlighted and the times that students will be aligned on vocabulary. These are not the only times that the musical events are experienced. So just looking here, we are experiencing songs in kindergarten in different modes, but we are not talking, we're not making that conscious. Students are not responsible for orally identifying and putting a label on those different modes in kindergarten. Let's talk about teaching sequences. This is something that I think can get lost in our conversations about curriculum planning, just in our efforts to kind of simplify and make music with students as quickly as we can, which of course I believe is a really good thing. But uh, just again, I think that understanding the why or talking about the why behind a sequence can be helpful when it's time to make some curricular decisions about what we are going to teach. 
One of the principles that we use here is this idea of moving from the known to the unknown. And this came out of the work of and the followers of Pestalozzi, if you remember talking about him at some point. The idea here is that when we learn, students don't just have new ideas appear in their heads. It's not like the teacher says something and opens our brains and puts that idea in our head and then it just lives here now, right? Instead, the idea of moving from the known to the unknown is that students need to connect new information. If we're going to learn something, it's because that new information is predicated on something older that we already know, something that we've already experienced. So having vocabulary and experiences laid out this way in kind of the spiral sequential model, this helps us compare new sounds to things that we already know. Is the pattern higher or lower? Is it longer or shorter? Questions like that help students build understanding based off of previous musical interactions. And that's the point of a teaching sequence. We're spiraling a concept like rhythm or pitch or form or whatever it is through multiple grades with multiple layers of complexity and multiple dimensions of kind of complex experiences. So everything builds. And I say that, I, I kind of narrow in that focus because the point is not that everyone needs to learn half notes in second grade or that half notes need to come before 16th notes. Uh, we don't all need to be following the same uniform sequence that stays exactly the same from situation to situation. But if we are choosing to follow this idea of the known to the unknown, we're probably going to want to have some sort of sequence. We shouldn't all have the same one. We definitely should not all have the same one at the same pacing. But moving from the known to the unknown, I think is really valuable. When we put together our sequence, we want the information to be in a logical and artistic flow of musical ideas. And the way we get there is by choosing a sequence that has patterns that are naturally represented, organically represented, um, like in the wild, so to speak. They exist naturally in the repertoire that we are using. So then all the teacher does is we help students guide their ears and guide their focus so that we can extract one of those patterns that already is there. So with the idea that our sequence should be logical and exist naturally in the repertoire, we have a lot of options for what we might use in our classrooms, right? And different music teachers do use many different variations of teaching sequences. I have yet to see a text in the exact same uniform sequence from kindergarten through fifth grade from two different musical authors. And even with practitioners um, I know who use very similar sequences, I know that they don't go through the exact same instructional steps within that sequence to get to their end result. So again, I say that to, just to illustrate each situation is different. So um, to that end, let's look at some different examples of teaching sequences. So rhythmic and melodic sequences normally have to do with which specific patterns we are extracting from the repertoire. There's normally a notation component of these uh, patterns as well, even if we are not introducing that notation right away. And a lot of educators structure their curricula around rhythm and pitch or rhythm and tonal patterns. And in my view, this is because having oral training and a common vocabulary around rhythm and pitch, that allows us to communicate more clearly about the other musical elements. So for example, we can describe the form of the song easier if we can describe the rhythmic changes in the different sections of that Form. It's easier for us to describe the harmonic outline of a piece if we have some training and some common vocabulary around how to describe the contour of the bass line. These are kind of what I think of as pillar progressions that do a lot of heavy lifting in our discussions of other elements. Now, the other categories like form and texture and harmony, blah, 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 those also arise from the repertoire, but we don't typically see musical curricula grounded on these concepts in the way that we do see them with rhythm and tonal patterns. A lot of these things are going to come up as students are ready for them from a skills-based perspective and as they just naturally show up in the repertoire. So because different authors talk about this in different ways, I was able to synthesize a lot of material from um, a lot of different texts and you can find a big list of those references in the description box below. All of the sequences that we have looked at are logical and artistic flows of musical patterns and vocabulary. So which one should we choose and which one will work for us in a way that feels cohesive? 
Obviously, the one I like is the one that we are using inside the planning binder, but the good news is we are not stuck with one set sequence that we find in a textbook or a website, or in very rare cases are we stuck. Hopefully this gives us a sense, looking at all of these different sequences, um, it gives us a sense of the menu options that we have as we are looking for a spiraled progression of concepts for our programs. We can make decisions based on our preferences and our students and our repertoire. And that's one of the big implications of a sequence. The sequence that we use is going to impact the repertoire we select. And of course, this dance goes the other way too, right? The repertoire we select is going to impact the sequence that we use. And different practitioners are going to have different opinions on this chicken and egg discussion. So again, this progression is going to come from naturally occurring patterns in the repertoire. And with that lens, when we come across a fun activity that we want to try, the question is not, what grade is this song for? The question is instead, what previous knowledge or musical interaction is this song experience predicated on? So what's missing from this document? Well, a lot. From a content standpoint, there are plenty of concepts in music that exist, and they are not listed here at all. Music is a big subject to tackle, and it extends far beyond the parameters of this document. Howard Gardner commented that the enemy of understanding is coverage, and I think that that quote is very helpful here. The other thing is when we start to think about what this document might look like in our classrooms, it becomes very obvious very quickly that there are things missing here in terms of musical actions. This document tells us what students are learning, broadly speaking, but it does not tell us what students are going to do with this information. Right? This gives us the content, but it doesn't give us any sense of the instruction because we know that we are going to go far beyond reading and writing with all of these concepts, but that's not really reflected here. There are so many ways that we could actualize our musical knowledge with musical skills and many different dimensions of social interaction and social connection. And we could also um, add in things like an enduring understanding and we could connect things to macro concepts. We could show our learning with an authentic assessment, right? It goes on and on and on. We tend to weave together a lot of different things when we use the word curriculum, and I'm doing it here as well. Wiggins and McTighe talked about how the Latin roots of the word are a course to be run. And Colin Conway also talked about curriculum as being so much more than a document. We're talking about what is taught, we're talking about what is learned, and we're talking about how we're going to move students through that learning process. So this document is limited and it's limited on purpose. It gives us a big picture of musical concepts that are spiraled throughout the program. And in my opinion, it is extremely useful because it gives us a snapshot view, a snapshot way to streamline our decisions. That way we're not stuck in this cycle of just looking for fun activities to fill time in our lesson planning, right? The activities that we choose are going to lead to something that we know is going to lead to something else and then something else and then something else. Okay, we've talked about a lot of things here. We have looked at an example of a curriculum outline, but we've also framed it with several other teaching progressions and ways of thinking that we might consider in a spiral curriculum. If you have a question or a comment on this video, I would love to hear from you. You can drop a comment below. You can find me on Instagram. I am at Victoria Bowler, or you can shoot me an email, victoria at victoriabowler.com. Thank you so much for watching and happy teaching.